be assured that God is stronger, even m- stronger than the most overwhelming situation that you are in or ever will be in. Your God is stronger, your God is bigger, and He is working out His good plans and purposes in your lives and my life. Can you hear amen from God's people? Amen. amen. The Lord encourages you today. Now, today I'm continuing on the Ephesians series, and uh, I've entitled my sermon, United We Grow. United We Grow. Now, I am uh, doing some new uh, approach lah, in the PowerPoint, so now we do it this way. Uh, some of the things may not be exactly in your outline. You will have to try to catch it uh, on the main thing, but I know you are very smart people. Amen? Amen. 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 You are very quick people. So, united we grow, taking from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 16. And uh, in this sermon, I want to uh, cover uh, four questions uh, and um, talking about Christian unity. And I think we all know how important Christian unity is all about. We know we need one another to do God's work. We know that we cannot do things alone. We know we all each have different, distinct, unique um, roles to play in God's kingdom. I remember a story about this uh, captain of a ship and he had a problem with his chief engineer. For some reason, they cannot get together and they are always quarrelling and the captain feels that he doesn't really need this chief engineer, he can do his job. And the chief engineer felt the same way. He feels that the captain's job is just very easy, he can do his job as well. So they don't have much respect for one another. So one day after a big quarrel, they decided to switch place. The, the captain said, okay, I will do your job, you do mine. Then we'll see how this goes. So they changed. And so the ship went out, they changed. Then for a while, then after that, suddenly, the ship stopped. And the, chief, uh, the, the captain immediately ran up. Because now it is the chief engineer on top of the deck. He ran up and said, Chief, Chief, come and help me. I cannot get the engine running. Then the chief engineer who was at the deck, he says, Of course you can't get it running. I have run your ship onto the ground. (laughs) So maybe this story tells us that we all need one another. Turn to your neighbor and say, I need you. We all need one another. We, we probably cannot think that, oh, I can do a better job or I can do the other person's job. Sometimes, God has placed us in the body of Christ. Each have its role, unique role to play. And we need one another. We need one another. Now, united we grow. I am, uh, in this passage, Ephesians 1, uh, Ephesians 4, verse 1 to 16, uh, perhaps can answer to us four questions. And uh, first question is, how do we maintain Christian unity? Secondly is, what is the basis of Christian unity? Third, how does God help us in Christian unity? And lastly, what are the outcomes of Christian unity. I pray today, after the sermon today, you leave this place, you have an idea of the uh, answers to this question. You you have an idea what Christian unity is all about, how you're going to do it, and how God is partnering with us, and when we have it in place, what we can expect for God to do in our midst and in this church. So coming to the first question, how do we maintain Christian unity? And we find the answer in the first few um, verses from Ephesians 4, verse 1 to verse 3 specifically. And if you can't see this, you probably will need to uh, read your Bible. Uh, 4, 1 to 3, it says, Paul wrote, it says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you, 
to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Therefore, he, he was connecting the first three chapters, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. And we remember, uh, speakers have been reminding us, I myself included, uh, that the first three chapters were theological. The first three chapters were telling you your position, your privilege as a believer of Jesus Christ. So Paul, through the first three chapters, was telling the Christians, this is how you have been richly blessed. And now he says, after covering that, he says, therefore, in view of those things, he says, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. In view of your blessings, you are to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And how are you to do that? It is with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, and being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so from these verses, we understand that to maintain Christian unity, we need at least these six qualities that Paul has highlighted. What are these qualities? First is the quality of humility. Say with me, humility. humility. To maintain Christian unity in our midst. Now, the word Paul used, choose his word very carefully. He says, preserve Christian unity. He says, maintain Christian unity. Those words says means that actually we already have Christian unity. Today you are seated here, we are united. The call is not to create unity. We do not need to create unity. We only need to preserve the unity God has already established between all of us here. Say me, we are united. We are already united. We only need to learn today. The, the sermon is going to tell you what you need to do to learn to preserve unity. And so the first quality is humility. What does that word mean? It means lowliness of mind. And what it means is that all that we have and all that we are are due to God's grace. That's all. Then uh, it's not about lowliness of self, but an understanding that we are moving on, living by the grace of God. And then we need the other quality, which is gentleness, which is actually strength under control. Now, gentleness is, does not mean just like being soft, being ladylike. That's not what it means. Gentleness is strength under control, like a horse, a wild horse that has been tamed. Can turn to your neighbor and say, I was a wild horse. And now you are tamed by the Spirit of God, so you are gentle. So do not mistook the, 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 the gentleness of Zhu Yang. He's not as gentle as he, you should have seen him before Christ. If that is a bit harder to, hard to imagine, then look at Zhu Yang. Ah. I'm still trying to tie some rope around him. Still work in progress. <laughs> and if you can't really imagine what gentleness is all about, then look at me. Ah, I am still really, really work in progress. Okay. <laughs> patience, the other quality, is patience in order to build unity. And patience means long temper. It gives the, the idea that you, you are willing to, to, to uh, sort of like, you are not reactive, not easily provoke. And uh, you, the opposite of having a short fuse. Long temper is the opposite of short fuse. So you have that kind of patience to build uh, spiritual unity. Also, you need tolerance. Now, tolerance is, means the, the sense of the word is to give the other person room to be different, to give another person the room to be different. Don't we want people to be just like us, or at least what we expect them to be? We want them to be nice, we want them to be smiling, we want them to always be happy, we want them to always be agreeable to us. But here, 
Paul says, if we want to maintain, if you and I want to maintain spiritual unity in the church, we want to preserve it, then we must learn to allow people the room to be different. Now, in this sense, to, it does not mean uh, morally uh, speaking. It means if someone is in sin, then we have the, the responsibility to, 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 to talk to the person and minister to the person. But it is more of like our habits, our personality. We allow room for people to be more dominant. We allow room for people to be more sensitive. We give them room. We give them room to cry when they pray. Doesn't mean they cry, they pray means, are you why like that? You know who I'm referring to, right? <laughs> we got to give each other people room to be different. You have to give me room to shout over the microphone. I am different. Some of you are very gentle. Tolerance. Tolerance means like we are cats and dogs, but we still can live together. Uh, turn to anybody and say, are you a cat or a dog? Uh, so I see many cats and dogs here, but we are not fighting. We are sitting together. Now, after tolerance, another quality to build, which we all know is very important, is love. So the, the, the point is that Paul says tolerate with love because he says don't just tolerate. Do it in love. Because tolerate, you are just suppressing yourself. You are just controlling. Just you wait. One day, one fine day, you step on my tail again, I'm going to jump on you. One fine day. But love, love says be gracious. Love says, nah, have more on my tail. All right. <laughs> love is like sleeping together and hugging together. Not just sitting together, but loving one another. I'm not asking you to just go around hugging each other. All right, uh, you better qualify. Uh. Last quality is diligence. We need to work hard on these qualities. The idea is deliberate effort. Means I intentionally, it's not going to be like I feel I want to be humble. It's not going to be, sometimes it's just not going to be that easy. There are times uh, we can be very loving, but there are times we find it so difficult, especially when the offense is being repeated then we find it very difficult. And that's where deliberate effort needs to be added in. We have to be deliberately, be humble, be gentle. We have to do it uh, with discipline. And it's, it gives the idea of a rock climber, deliberate effort. Every step is hard work, is, is intentional is measured. And so if we want to build spiritual unity, I will not going to tell you, Paul tells us clearly from his word, he implies very clearly to maintain spiritual unity is not like a very, uh, oh, so easy, just sing some songs and then we'll be lovey-dovey to one another. There will be times that we will be rubbing off one another and iron sharpens iron. And we will have, at those moments, remember that we have to allow each other to be different. We have to love. We have to let love be our yardstick in relating to such people. And so that's the first question, what is needed for Christian unity? And then now what is the basis of Christian unity? And Paul answers that in the next passage in 4, verse 4 to 6, Ephesians 4. He says there's one body, one spirit, and not as you also were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord and one faith and one hope. All right, how come the thing jump until you like that? It looks like Vietnamese to me, man. Uh, okay. What happened to it, uh, Jerry? Uh, I'm not sure. So uh, let, me, let me read the scripture. Okay. Um, okay. 
one hope of your calling, one Lord, and then uh, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So, this I think is also very important. I feel many Christians misunderstood the concept and the meaning of Christian unity. And so, when we misunderstand it, then we always say, are you the church? Ah? The church is not united. Ah. We are not doing things together. The church is not united because we are not coming together. When the church organizes a program, not everybody is here. We are not united. Ah. We are not united. Are you, the pastors in Johor Bahru are not united because every church is doing their own thing. When they have a pastor's gathering, not everybody come. The church pastors are not united. And that is because uh, we say these things because we don't really have an idea what Christian unity is all about. Today, I pray as I reveal this to you through God's Word, you have a better understanding of Christian unity. And you will think carefully before even you say something about whether this church is united or not, or whether pastors are united or not, or you even say other churches, they are not united, or are they united? Think carefully. What is Christian unity? Christian unity is more than just fellowship. Christian unity is more than just doing good together. Christian unity is more than just coming together and do the same thing. We always say unity is not uniformity. It does not mean that we always have to be in the same place, doing the same thing, then only we are united. In a church such as this, we have many activities, we have many programs, as the Lord leads you to do what you let, we, we encourage you to do it. We hope we can equip you and send you out and you do it. But it's okay. It does not mean that you are in the hospital ministry, some are in the usher, and, and so we are not united. We do not need to do the same ministry to be united. We do not always need to do the same thing to be united. We do not need even to always, oh, Saturday service and Sunday service, we are not united because we worship at a different time. No. What is the basis of Christian unity? We must know where is the basis of our unity. Then you know that you are united. That's why Paul says, maintain, preserve the unity that is already among you. Because he was very, very confident of the unity that was in the church of Jesus Christ at his time. And same way, I'm also very confident of the unity that we all have, but it's not based because we are always eating uh, roti chanai with me. I feel united with you. But it's not because you are always jogging in Sire Park with me. No. I feel united with you simply because we share a common relationship with our God. And that's important. We share a common relationship with God. Jerry, I noticed when I changed to yellow, the outline is gone. Is it because of the download? Huh? Because I think I did all with outline. But need to check on this. Huh? We'll work on this. Okay, so we're bound up with our common relationship with God. What is our common relationship? We have one body. We belong to one body. Regardless of all that can divide us, the believers, uh, we may come from different backgrounds. We can come from different churches. We can come even from di different denominations. But we belong to one universal church. Whatever your background, you come from an independent church, you come from a Methodist church, you come from a Presbyterian church, you come from a Baptist church, you come from an AG church. It doesn't matter. We all belong to one universal church. Can you hear amen from God's people? And that's why we are one. That's why we are spiritually united. We have one spirit. You don't have like different kind of Holy Spirits in us. The Holy Spirit who dwells in me, the same Holy Spirit who dwells in you. One Spirit of God. The same Spirit 
that in, regenerates you, gives you the new life, the same spirit that indwells in you now, that empowers you, we is all the same spirit. We can be in different locations, we can be even worshipping in different churches, but we have the same spirit and that's the unity there. That's the unity that Paul is talking about. He was trying to emphasize this point. One hope of our calling. We all believe in this same future. Wherever we are coming from, we believe that Jesus is coming back in power. Whether we believe in pre-rapture, pre-millionist, amillionist, doesn't matter. We still believe that Jesus is coming in power. When we will be changed to be like Christ and we will share in His glory. That is our unity. We have one Lord. We do, not, we do not have many lords from which to choose. There is only one. So we need to understand, we only worship one Lord. It's not like you come to Church of Praise, there's one Lord of Church of Praise. Then you go to another church, go to another church Lord there. No. Whichever church you go, Whichever church you go, you come from, when you are worshipping, uh, Sundays or Saturdays, you are not here. When you are worshipping, we are worshipping the same God, the same Lord. One faith, while we may differ over some theological views, they are essential doctrines that we agree and we affirm. We agree and affirm that Jesus is the Son of God. We agree and affirm that Jesus was sent by God to die for our sins and so that when we believe in Him, we will have eternal life. We have the same belief, the major doctrine. We also have one baptism. We, whether it's sprinkling or whatever, we all believe that we are identified with Christ his death and His resurrection through water baptism. We have one God and Father of all. God is the Father of all Christians. Of all Christians, though we are a family of many members, we have one heavenly Father. So this is the basis of our Christian unity. I pray this sink deep into your heart. If there are some of you who are struggling with, uh, with, with when you see uh, maybe the conflicts in churches, maybe you, uh, you see the conflict even between churches, the competition sometimes you see, it's fine. We will have this. We are human. We are imperfect beings. There will be some things that are still happening, but that doesn't mean we are not united in the Spirit. As far as Paul is concerned, the revelation of God was upon him to deliver this message to all of us, even up to today. That Christian unity, Christian unity is based, is bound by our common relationship with the one Lord, the one Spirit, and the one Heavenly Father. We need to understand that. The next question is, how does God help us in Christian unity? And that is in Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. And the Bible says, Paul says, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. And in, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. So, the point is that the Lord gives leadership gifts to the church. And these leadership gifts comes in the form of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And it is those with these leadership gifts, they are meant to equip the saints for the work of service. And I think it is important to take note of that, to equip. To equip means to make something adequate or sufficient for something. All right. And so this is the role of the pastors. This is the role of the pastors and the teachers and the, those with leadership gifts. It gives the idea of mending broken necks to, so that to prepare for the next fishing expedition, preparing for another mission. 
It gives the idea of mending broken bones so that the leg can walk again. So the ministry of the, the pastoral leadership of the church is to release healing uh, by, uh, by equipping people, by releasing healing and ministering to the needs of the hurting people so that after they are healed, they can continue to serve the Lord. It gives the idea of preparing a room for someone to come to stay. So as a pastor, I am preparing you so that your lives will be a blessing to others. When people connect with you, they are warmed by your hospitality of your love. So this is the idea of the church leadership. And it is important that you catch this, that if we are here to equip you. Our primary uh, responsibility is to equip you, not to do the work in place of you. You know, there are some churches, but of course not in church of praise, where pastors are treated like employees. We employ a pastor to do youth work. We employ a pastor to do preaching. We employ a pastor to do this hospitality, pastor to do hospitality. We employ a, 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 a pastor to take care of the, the needs of the church we employ. Now, this is not biblical. The pastors are gift of God to the church to equip you to do the ministry. Of course, there are times the pastor will have to rise up because there are not enough people doing or there are times the pastor has to set an example or to teach the people how to do it, have to demonstrate it. There are times. But that is not our main role. That we are not employing, I didn't employ Zi Yang to just do youth work. We didn't employ him to just do JC Reddick's ministry. We employ him, and the day when he comes, he's ordained or, or, or installed as a pastor, he is to equip people to do the work of the ministry. He is to equip his leaders to do the ministry in the youth ministry. We didn't employ Sharon to go to hospital every week to do the hospital ministry. Her role is to equip, encourage, strengthen some of you here who have the call to go to the hospital ministry. And one day you do the ministry. And then she go and equip other people. And Tzu Yang will also go and equip other group of people. And I also will be equipping other groups of people. We are not employed to do the work of the ministry to replace you. Okay? You... Our role, our primary role, is not really to do the work, actually. Ideally, we are here to equip you, encourage you to do the work of the ministry. Don't so serious, ah. <laughs> I will still serve with you, okay? <laughs> Pastors are to teach the word, to prepare the church so that they may serve the Lord in accordance with their gifts. And so, what are the... The fourth question, what are the outcomes of Christian unity? Ephesians 4, 14 to 16, it says, As a result, after this is happening, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men or deceitness in deceitful scheming, uh, it's craftiness and deceitful scheming and but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So when Christian unity is maintained, four things will happen to the church of Jesus Christ. There will be growth in stability. The church will be more stable. There will be, the, the truth will be balanced with love. We will not just be going around correcting people, but we will be correcting people with love in our heart. There will also be growth in Christ's likeness. There will be transformation in all our character. And there will be growth in cooperation. People are willing to work together even though they may not really like one another, but for the sake of the gospel, they will work together. There's a lot of cooperation going on. 
So how can we apply what we learn? A few thoughts here. One is that doctrine must affect our lifestyle. Like what uh, Tzu Yang prayed and what um, um, Meishan emphasized. We must be doers of the word. We don't just want to know the word. We want to do the word. Our doctrine, our understanding, our knowledge of theology must affect our lifestyle. We must understand that. We must balance our knowledge with proper conduct. Paul says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling. The, name, the, the word worthy actually means he has the idea of weight balance on a scale. Our conduct, in other words, should match God's grace for us. Our conduct, our behaviour should balance the blessings of God in our life. Because the first three chapters, Paul talked about that the blessings of God, which I highlighted some of it in Ephesians 1. If you are here, you have heard my message. You know, I talk about that we are already spiritually blessed. He highlighted all the blessings. And I believe most of you here, if not all of you here, you know we are seated here. You are the recipients of God's blessing. But now when it comes to chapter 4, Paul is emphasizing the same thing. Okay, now that you know you are blessed, it's not just about you being blessed. I want you to know your life, your conduct must balance the blessings that God has given you. Balance, say me balance. So the question is, is your life balanced? Is your conduct balanced with the favour of God upon your life? You are blessed. We all know that I am blessed. But is my conduct balancing well with the blessings that God has given us? Or is it lopsided? The blessings of God is so heavy. The, the blessing, the calling of who we are, which is a blessing, being the chosen one. It is, it is so much until our, our conduct is not making it balanced. Paul is saying make it balanced. Make sure my life is balanced in this sense. The way I behave balance up the blessings of God in my life. Worthy of it. You know, sometimes we, we have a lot of knowledge we can preach it, but then we don't apply. I remember reading this article in Wall Street Journal. He said, what is the most common piece of advice doctor give, but don't take? I don't know how many potential doctors here or you are doctors here, but just realize that. Huh? Have you ever asked that question? The doctors, you go to see them, they have a lot of advice to you, but you wonder whether they are taking the advice themselves. So it seems, according to this research that they make with some particular groups of doctors, he says 40%, uh, no, the, the, to them the research says, you know, which one is the most common piece of advice doctors give? Uh, in that research, they found out the most common piece of advice is that don't burn yourself out, the doctor says. Don't burn yourself out. But then the research says that the, out of the doctors who are giving the advice, 40% of them are actually burned out. So they tell patients, don't burn out, but they are burning out. They tell patients, exercise, but do they exercise? They tell patients, you must relax, must rest. Are they resting? They are working day and night. So the, the advice. So sometimes we as Christians, I think we need, to, we need also to be congruent. My, my point is that we need to be congruent. We know a lot of doctrine. We know how to preach doctrine. We know how to advise people through our doctrines. But the question today is not your knowledge. The question today is how is this knowledge changing you? The question is are you applying it to yourself first? It's so easy to tell people to cast your cares unto the Lord. But am I casting my cares unto the Lord? It's so easy to tell you that God is stronger in your problem. 
But do I myself really believe that God is stronger in my problem? It's so easy to tell you, trust God, pray, He'll heal you. But when I'm sick, do I really trust and surrender to God? It's one thing to say and another thing to do. So we need to understand that. So the main, the first application I would think of will be that doctrine must affect, must balance our behavior, by our behavior, must be balanced. Christianity also is not a spectator sport. You know, one um, coach actually said this word. He says, I defy, they ask him what is football, he's a football coach. And out of the definition, you realize how frustrated he is. He says, I would define football as 22 men on the field, desperately needing rest, and 22,000 fans in the, fan, in the stadium, desperately needing exercise. <laughs> so he's actually giving it to the spectators. We only know how to talk, but we are working, our, uh, working hard, you know, to try to play the game. And you guys are just cheering and just criticizing and talk very easy. But we need to understand today, and I know you do. I want you to know this is the right way to go. That for, for church of praise to grow, it's not going to happen for you to just sit there and see how some of us are performing. No. The question today is, are you part of the team? The question today for some of you here, we are not here to ask you to just continuously, we love feedbacks, we want to improve, but we, your role is not just to give us feedback and tell us how to improve. Your role is to ask yourself, what are you doing? How proactive are you? Are you proactive in this church, doing your part to grow this church? You have a role to play. Say me, I have a role to play. Every one of you. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Unity, when we are talking about unity, is also every believer's responsibility. It's not enough for me to preach about unity. It's not enough for me to demonstrate unity. It's not enough for me to just do what I preach. All of us here have to do it. Say me, I have to do it. All of us have a responsibility. It's all so easy to just blame someone else. In this culture today, it is easy to blame our misfortune on others. Do you know that in America, there is a bill called the Cheeseburger Bill. They approved it, the House of Representatives uh, approved it in 2004. Do you know what is the Cheeseburger Bill? The Cheeseburger Bill prevents people who always go to fast food like McDonald's, a and and they eat a lot and then they grow fat. Then they sue the company. They say, you give us lousy food. That's why we are fat. And now I have heart problem. Now I have diabetes. Cheeseburger bill. Huh. But America, they don't have pastor's bill. They still can sue the pastor for what they talk. <laughs> but this, this just tells me that this is the, the nature or, or, or fallen humankind who you like to blame. The Americans, this bill tells us that a majority of them can come up to this extent. It's not that they are not disciplined. They, they, they are not saying that I, they, they are not going to take responsibility. When they grow fat, they say it's McDonald's fault. When they grow fat, they say it's Kentucky Fried Chicken fault. To the point they sue so much that they have to come up with a bill to stop them and say, hey, no more such suing in the court. Huh? Enough already. You know, it's that bad, you know, until a law has to come out to control them. Stop blaming people and start taking responsibility for yourself. So my point is that we all have a responsibility. Unity is also your responsibility. Christian unity, maintaining church Christian unity is your responsibility. It's about you and me taking up our responsibility. And 
to maintain, I think, spiritual unity in a practical sense, focus on what unites us, not what divides us. You know, there, there are many things that we can look at that we can say we are different. Are you? Not the same. How come uh, he or she is doing this way? And I keep focusing on that. Then I will not be happy. And then I cannot work with this person. Because every time I see, I'm not seeing what the person is doing that is aligned with me. I'm only picking up the things that is not aligned with me. But probably it's only 10%. What this person do is not a lie, it's different. The 90% that we can agree to work together, that, and I, I don't see it. And if I don't see it, then things get ugly. I need to tell myself, I need to focus. Focus on what unites us. Our passion for God. Our desire to see the gospel preached our desire to see more souls added unto God's kingdom, our desire to see the Saturday service, all the seats fill up, our desire to see that all who come to this church, they leave this church, they live blessed, our desire to be a blessing to others. These are things that unite us, our desire to worship God no matter what. This is our, the things that unite us. We need to focus on that. I remember this uh, uh, singer, I uh, can't read that, that is all Vietnamese language up there. Uh, let me. Okay, this, this is about these three tenors uh, by the name of Jose Carreras, Plaquido Domingo, and Luciano Pavarotti. All right, so. Um, this is a quote. This is a quote by Placido Domingo because they are three very famous tenors. So the, the people were asking them uh, how you all can perform together because they are all great soloists. They all hold concerts by their own and they draw a lot of people to their concerts. But on one particular occasion, they sang together. So the press was a bit curious three famous, talented uh, tenors and singers coming together. How will they not be competitive? Will they not be like saying, hey, you are singing the wrong key, hey, you shouldn't be singing like that because they are leaders in their own right, they are, they are a success in their own right. But this is what one of them says. He says, you can't be rivals when you are together making music. So what he's saying is that it's not about the competition. We are just so engrossed to make good music. This is their vision. This is what unites them. And so I pray today that we have this same spirit. If there be any comparison or competitiveness among us let, or any differences, let, it, let us put it aside because we, we can't be enemies, we can't be fighting one another when we are together serving the Lord. Whatever our character, personality, background, we are all here for one purpose, to glorify God, to worship Him, to serve Him. Can I hear amen from God's people? Amen. Just remember that. And you are serving in your capacity Another brother or sister is serving in another, but we all are going towards the same direction. We are doing our part for the body of Christ. Also to appreciate the people who are different from you. Different gifts and viewpoints can help the church. And so sometimes you are doing something, someone come and give some opinion, it's very easy to be quickly defensive and start defending why we are doing this. But sometimes it's good. It's good to hear another point of view. It is not easy. We will feel at times, we will just wonder 
in the chat group, I propose something, why this person got so many comments on? <laughs> then you think, ah, you, this person, uh, why did I put him in uh, or her in? Maybe next time, how to get him or her out now? Every time I say something, sure got something other perspective coming in. But sometimes, this is good for us to improve. There was uh, this group called uh, the Washington Redskins, uh, footballers. And uh, Time Magazine one time described, uh, uh, as they observed, how successful they were. And they found out that this team have all kinds of people. They have blacks, they have whites. And then you see they have tall people, they have short people. It was so small, this guy also playing inside football. Then what they conclude is this. Time Magazine says, what counts most in creating a successful team is not how compatible its players are, but how they deal with incompatibility. You know, it's another way to see things, right? Sometimes, even as a, a marriage counsellor, the, the, the thing that is in my mind is suitability. But this quote made me rethink my approach towards relationship. Sometimes it's not how suitable we are. We are in this church. It's not our choice to, to decide who comes into the church. I cannot be sitting there and have a checklist. Are you like this? Are you like that? Okay, you are not. You didn't fulfill our requirement. Next week, don't come back to service. Ah. <laughs> God like that. Wow. Where God? Can I tell you? Hey, um, I think, brother, you are not very suitable for our church. Uh. Or maybe more polite, our church, I think, not very suitable for you. <laughs> Can say like that. Can not. So I think same thing. A successful church or a growing church will be, it's not about how suitable we are for one another, it was the how we deal those moments of unsuitability, those areas of incompatibility that makes us a church that is different from other churches. Okay, amen from God's people. It's how we handle our differences. Differences we will surely have. We can't expect where we will find a church where all of us can just, you know, not everyone like Zhu Yang one, you like him one. Some people are like me, and you have to live with me. <laughs> you have to learn how to deal with me in your life. Ministry is also the task of all believers. Wow, this is all kind of like writings in tongues. Eh? <laughs> Ministry is the task of all believers, small or, or large, use your unique gifts to contribute to the strength of the church. I'm saying this because sometimes I say ministry is a task of all believers. Some of you, your defense mechanism is already up. I'm not that gifted. I can't play guitar like Zhi Yang. I can't keep my hair long like Jerry. No. <laughs> Is that a ministry? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Small or large? Sometimes I give one like here. Yeah. Use your unique gifts. If you think you are too small, think about this quote. I love this quote. I always use it quite some, many times. If you think you are too small to make a difference, try spending the night in a closed room with a mosquito. That small thing can really turn your whole world upside down. That's the power of the small. And you all are mosquitoes. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you can create impact. In closing, I'm talking about the domino theory of spiritual impact uh, proposed by one, the founder of World Vision. He, he, he says this, he says, when one domino falls, we all know that it starts a chain reaction that can cause dozens or hundreds more 
to fall. And it says we are like that domino. We can create a chain reaction. We may be one now. The domino starts with one, falling. But then it affects all the way. 2,000 years ago, Jesus had 12 dominoes. He, he released them. And today, there are more than 2 billion Christ followers. The domino effect continues through the ages. Closer to home, an example that I can think of is about this man, 1880s. His name is Robert Wilder. He is an um, a, 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 a academician um, from Princeton University, a, a smart young man. Uh, he had a heart for vision, but uh, he, he was weak. So he cannot go for missions. But since he cannot go for missions, but his heart is for missions, the next thing, best thing that he can do is to preach about missions. So he make it his, his point, always to encourage and challenge people to go to the missions field. So he was the first domino. He started that. And he touched one man by the name of Samuel Moffat. One, this man one day sat in his ministry, was inspired. And so he was the second domino that fell. He touched this man's life. This man rise up. And then he felt the calling to go to Korea. He, he was the first Presbyterian missionary to Korea. And so he went to Korea. He, in his ministry, he brought this man to Christ, Ju Song Ju, who is considered as, for some, as the father of Korean Christianity. He was a non believer, uh, disillusioned with Taoism. He met this missionary and he gave his life to the Lord. So he was the third domino to fall. And from here on, things begin to pick up. A uh, few years later, in 1907, there was a revival in Pyongyang through this one man. Thousands came to know the Lord. When he died, five, uh, in 1935, 5,000 Christians came to attend his funeral. So from one domino, he has now become thousands of domino has fallen. And out of this movement, today, we know that in the church in Korea, some have estimated that there are almost 15 million Christians in uh, Korea. And in fact, uh, the Christian faith is considered, uh, if not the biggest, it's one of the growing, fastest growing religion in Korea. I don't know if Paul can affirm that in Korea. Yes, Paul say yes. Paul is from Korea. So, Paul is also one of the dominoes that was affected uh, by this domino, by this man, 1880. One man, one man, though he was sick, but just by passion for the Lord. He says, no, even I am sick, I cannot go to the mission field, I will preach about missions. And he has impacted until today, from this one domino until today, a nation has turned to the Lord. As Christians, we are all dominoes. All of you here are dominoes in this chain reaction set up by Jesus 2,000 years ago. Your action, you're going to touch lives. Every good work that you do for the Lord, every service that you offer unto the Lord is producing a domino effect whether it's in this church or it's outside the church. You are faithful in serving. A new brother or sister come to the church, sees you faithfully serving, inspired to say, oh, I also will want to serve. And then you serve. And then you touch lives. This is how the domino effect starts. We have no idea how big the impact will be as God multiplies our faithfulness. Genesis twenty-two seventeen. 17, this was the promise given to Abraham 
after he has proven his faith by his willingness to offer his son for sacrifice, the Lord says this to him, Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply. Say me multiply. The closest word that I can think of in the Bible to the domino theory is multiply. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. God will multiply your seed of service unto Him. Whatever that you do, no matter how small, that little act of kindness, that little act of love, that little act of graciousness, God will multiply that seed of your action and will multiply it like you'll be like stars of the heavens and just the sand which is on the seashore. Through you, if not hundreds, thousands, we do not know. But through you, it starts from you. The legacy you leave behind. So rise up, God's people. Rise up and do your part. And do not despise yourself. Do not despise small beginnings, little things that you do. The bread that you cast on the water, the Bible says, will one day come back to you. You will see the blessings of God through your ministry. Amen? Amen. Would you stand even as we close and we prepare our hearts for communion?